thank you so much for inviting me to such an inspiring and incredible day. I've been really, really moved and inspired like the whole time I've been here. So it's a real honour to be here speaking to you. Um, yeah, and I love the title of the event today, Story, because it's really just got me thinking how much I love story and how much I have loved story since, you know, I think from from the time when people would read me stories to then when I could read my own stories and would just love to get lost in worlds of stories. I'd love those the first moments when you enter a story and you find out you know, what that first impact is going to be upon that character that's going to send them off on an adventure or a transformation, transforming journey. Um, I just love it and I loved it stories so much that I went to uh, university and studied English literature um, and then during my degree in English literature I got very involved in acting. Um, so again, telling stories, but um, this time I was um, part of a group, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd read a play on a page and then a director would come in and tell us where to move and then people would de design a set around us and before we knew it we'd have costumes and makeup and we'd be performing it in front of people and it was just such an incredible journey and just, yeah, seeing people really be moved while these stories were unfolding. I really, really loved it. Um, but I was aware then I was telling other people's stories. I wasn't really telling my own. Um, and actually something kind of weird happened to me. Um, I uh, got a, um, a part at a, a very brilliant um, theatre in the West End called the Don Mar Warehouse. And it was a theatre that I'd always wanted to work at. And I got cast in a role there. And it was like that amazing phone call of, oh my God, I've got the part. Um, and actually, as I started working there, I realised I wasn't enjoying it as much as I, I thought I would. So it's this thing I'd been working towards for ages and ages. I suddenly couldn't work out why I wasn't really enjoying it as I thought I would. And um, a friend had recommended a book to me, and this book was called The Artist's Way, and it was all about creativity. And I thought, oh my God, maybe I'll read this book and it will help me reconnect with my love of acting and I'll really enjoy this amazing job I've got. So I started reading this book, this magical book called The Artist's Way, and one of the things it got you to do every morning was to write three pages of whatever was going on in your head. Now, my three pages of what's going on in my head is pretty much, I really want a cup of tea, I need the loo. But it just to keep going through that, just write whatever's in your head, um, three pages, put it away, get on with your day. And what was quite interesting is, whereas I'd been you know, thinking I wanted to do all this to, to reconnect me with my love of acting, what was coming out in my morning pages was a lot of stuff about my disastrous love life. Okay, and um, what I realized is that I'd been going through life going, um, I don't want a man, I want a career, I'm going to just focus on my acting. Um, and actually what had happened is because my previous boyfriend, we'd broken up and he'd stalked me. And um, so I had this period where I knew I couldn't meet a new man because I had this stalker, I wasn't very sociable. Um, so, I, um, so, but I'd, so what I'd realised is I put this kind of like wall of pride around me going, no, I don't want to meet anybody, I don't want to meet anyone. Um, when actually I kind of did. But it was really interesting because it was the first time in my life I'm writing these pages every morning and I'm connecting with my own story with what I was really feeling. And at the end of this play I did, I did something really odd for me. I started a blog. I started a blog about my disastrous love life. <laughs> okay, <laughs> as you do. And, um, and the blog was called A Spinster's Quest. I realized, I listened to a, um, a Paul Simon song, um, Simon and Garfunkel song, there must be 50 ways to leave a lover. And I was like, oh, if there must be 50 ways to leave a lover, there must be 50 ways to find a lover. So rather than me sit there going, I don't want a man, I'm gonna actually go out and see if I can meet somebody. So I took myself speed dating and did, did internet dating and all these things, and I wrote about them in blog posts. And what I found I loved, well, it was disastrous. My trying to find a man was absolutely disastrous. But what I found I loved was I loved the telling of the story. I love just creating little stories from these events that were happening. And then something rather cool happened. I got approached by some agents and publishers, and they said, we think you can write. We think this is really funny. We think you should write a novel. So I went, oh, okay. Um, and I, I had a go at writing a novel. Where, and uh, my brain nearly exploded about a thousand times. They're quite hard to write, these novel things. Um, and something quite brilliant happened like halfway through the first one because I, I was just basing everything on me. So this character was an out-of-work actress living in London, <laughs> looking for love. And then suddenly halfway through the writing of it, I thought, oh, oh, I get it. I don't have to have done everything I'm writing about. I can just use my imagination. I can just create things for this character to do. Um, and it was brilliant. And so I wrote a novel and it got published and I've written since then three more. So I've written four, four novels that have been published. But I actually, and I, and I felt it was amazing because I was telling stories. I was getting up every day and writing stories. Um, and I felt, wow, this is real. I'm really in control of my creativity writing these stories. But 
actually what I found is I wasn't really. <laughs> what I found is I'd write these stories and my publishers would say, oh, no, you can't really write about that. For example, I wanted to write a story about a woman who had an abortion. One in three women will have an abortion. And I thought, wow, I really want to explore that in a novel. Um, and I was told it was a no-no. I was told it was a no-no. Um, I wanted to write a story also, and I did, in fact, I did write a story about a woman um, who has mental health issues. Uh, and I kept being told to make this character more, make, make her more every woman. Make this character more every woman. And I was like, well, you know, I've got a lot of friends and we talk about mental health issues. This is something that's really affecting us. Um, who is this every woman you're referring to? I just kept feeling that the experience of being a woman was much more interesting and complicated than I was being allowed to explore it in the novels I was writing. And there was another thing that really got me. <laughs> so I'd write these novels and then I'd, I'd see the cover art for the novels that have been designed. And I'd be like, why have you put a cupcake on my cover? It's like, we don't, there's no mention of a cupcake. The character doesn't have a relationship with cupcakes. I don't particularly remember I can ta take or leave a cupcake. Um, why are you putting a cupcake on my cover? And then we'd come to the next book and I'd be like, don't put a cupcake on my cover, don't put, just put a cupcake on my cover. Um, just became this thing and it, and it really got me thinking. So after my fourth novel, I took a bit of time out. I was like, I'm gonna take a bit of time out because I really want to write about being a woman, yeah? As I said, I think it's more interesting and complicated than I'm being allowed to explore. Um, and I started writing a blog. I started writing a blog again where I could explore these things about being a woman. And I was writing a blog again. <laughs> and as before, what came out was a lot about my love life and my relationship stuff. And I was looking at it. So I'm writing about a lot of stuff in this blog. And I'm writing about, I'll tell you one thing I'm writing about, is I'm writing about the fact that I'm a bit of a hippie, yeah? I'm all about peace and love. I don't like hate. But what I realized is that I was lumping an awful lot of hate on myself. For example, I lost count of the amount of times I go, I hate my bum, I hate my bum. I'm so sorry, my bum's blocking out the light here. My bum's so massive, I hate my bum, I'm so sorry. Just lumping all this hate upon this, this bit of my body. And I was like, but, but I don't want to be hating anything, let alone a part of me. So I tried to turn this hate around. So I've, I started thinking, thinking about my bottom, and, I, and actually, when I thought about it, my bottom had never not been behind me, like a big, soft cushion on which I could sit whenever I fancied it. In fact, I'd done some pretty amazing things sat on my bottom. I'd written books sat on my bottom, held newborn babies. Why was I hating my bottom? I love my bum, I started saying. Uh, I started thinking about other things. I started thinking about the relationships I'd been in, and, and this was quite interesting for me because I started thinking, <laughs> how here was me, and I'd done stuff on West End theatres, and I'd written books, and I was quite able to make things happen in quite a powerful way in my own life. And yet when it came to me in relationships with men, I became a bit of a plonker, really. I, I found what I'd do is I'd give away my power, right? So normally, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I want to do this, I want to do this, let's do this. With a man, I'd be like, oh, whatever you want. I'd be like, what's going on here? This is, it felt really weird. It felt like I was just, yeah, in a relationship and just giving somebody the power. And I, and I couldn't work it out, and it was frustrating me. But then when I started to think about it and explore it in this blog, I thought, okay, okay, this is kind of starting to make sense. I realized that most of the relationships I'd seen growing up, the men had the power, and the women sort of compromised their own needs for the men. That was just what I'd seen. You know, the happy relationships, I'm not criticizing them, but this is just what I'd seen. I'd also grown up in a culture <laughs> that everywhere presented women as being there for men. I, um, I'll get to page three in a minute, but page three is a prime example of this. Like on the third page of a newspaper, you've got a big image of a naked woman for men. You know, it's kind of a big indicator that it's a man's world, that women are there for men. Um, and I'd kind of absorbed all this, I suppose. You know, you have to look at fairy tales, go back to fairy tales. The stories that we're told are, you know, the men go out and have the adventures and slay the dragons, and at the end, a father might give a beautiful daughter to the man who's done all the adventures. But what about if you want to be doing the adventures? You don't just want to be given away and passive and disempowered. So I was, I was kind of thinking about all this sort of stuff and exploring it on a blog. Um, and I was also thinking about, yeah, I'd, 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 I'd hated my bottom, but I'd also hated my boobs. And actually, when I went into why I didn't like my breasts, it wasn't as comedy um, as when I was looking at why I didn't like my bottom. And um, because what I realized is that I'd always just always said, oh, I hate my boobs, I hate my boobs, as a lot of women do. And as I said, I was, you know, a bit of a hippie, don't want to be hating any part of me. Um, and so I sat there, and I, I was tracing the hate back. And I, and I actually, um, it made me really sad, because I traced it back to being an 11-year-old girl developing. And what had happened is, um, I grew up, as I said, with the sun in my house. So the sun was a newspaper read in my household. And, and as an 11-year-old girl, I just, my breasts came 
And they didn't look like the breasts on page three that the men around me were talking about. And I just absorbed the fact that my breasts were developing and they were there for men to look at. And mine didn't look like the ones in the newspaper. And therefore, I just sort of failed and I just felt ashamed of that part of my body. So I was like, oh, I hate, I hate, I hate my boobs, I hate my boobs. Anyway, when I'm older and thinking about all this, it, it just made me feel really sad. I was like, oh, I just wanted to hug that little, <laughs> that little 11-year-old girl and say, oh, you're just comparing yourself to an image in a newspaper. You don't need to, you know, to hate your body. You can love your boobs. So I was doing a lot of exploring like this. Um, this is what I was thinking, um, all, all these sort of things. And then I had, I suppose, my own light bulb moment. <laughs> so my own moment at the beginning of, of stories. Um, um, and that light bulb moment came um, during the summer um, of 2012, during the Olympics. Um, and I actually bought a copy of the Sun newspaper. Um, as I said, I grew up with the Sun. And my brother always used to say it was the best newspaper for sport. And I was like, oh, Olympics, sport. Um, bought the Sun. And um, I loved the Olympics. I was just, it was brilliant. And, and I think it was the Olympics was brilliant for a lot of women because generally we don't see women's sport covered. Um, well, nearly at all. Women's sport gets the same coverage as men's darts. 5% um, uh, of sport covered is women's sport. But the Olympics was such an exception to that. And it was so brilliant to see these women, you know, to, to like, I don't know, like be there, you know, like crossing the finishing line with them and seeing them celebrating on podiums. Um, and I, I, I was really inspired. I bought new trainers. I thought about taking up competitive sport. I didn't, but I thought about it. I was definitely inspired. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really inspired. Um, I keep using the word inspired, it's very inspired. Um, uh, and I bought the Sun, and I, funnily enough, I didn't see a page three model that day on page three, and I didn't see her on page five. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. The Sun must have dropped page three while the Olympics was on. Um, and I thought maybe it was out of respect for other cultures who might have been visiting the country. So I, anyway, I buy the paper, and I'm reading all about Jessica Ennis. Jessica Ennis has just won this incredible gold medal. Um, I'm reading about Team GB, and then suddenly I turn to page 13, and there was this massive image of a very beautiful young woman standing in her knickers. And it was really weird. It, it, it was really weird. It, it, it weirded me out. It felt on that day like someone had just quickly slapped me in the face and told me it was a man's world. It was like, there I was reading about men and women doing this stuff, and then it was just like, oh, here's this picture, and it's really not for you, it's for men. And it's in a newspaper, and it was like, whoa, what's the world? Um, and, it's, and I'd seen these images before, so, but on that day, it really made me think. And I think what really got me is that hers was the largest female image. So it was larger than any of the images of Jessica Ennis or any other woman in the paper. The overriding image you had of a woman was of the young woman standing in a knickers showing her breasts for men. And I was like, wow, what's that saying? What is that saying about a woman's place in society? What's it, you know, this is a family newspaper. What's it teaching little girls about where their value lies? What's it teaching little boys about where girls' value lies? Um, yeah, and I, I, it was really interesting because it was that context. It was the context of, oh, here are all these pages of men in clothes <laughs> doing things. <laughs> you know, the men are running the country. They're achieving in sport. Oh, what are the women doing? Oh, they're standing in their knickers showing their breasts for men. It just felt like two really different messages we were sending out about each gender. Um, that one was powerful and active and clothed, and the other was passive and therefore, and therefore the other gender. Um, and I really couldn't stop thinking about it. Um, I really couldn't stop thinking about it. <laughs> it was one of these things where once you have a thought, it takes you to another thought and another and another. And I'm I'd, I'd, a few times like woke in the night thinking about this. Um, and I'd think, cause I'd, I think, I woke in the night one night thinking, oh my goodness, I've got friends who've breastfed and, and they've all told me at various points how uh, they were made to feel uncomfortable for breastfeeding in public or how they were asked to move, asked to go into a toilet and do it. And I was like, this is weird. We're making women feel uncomfortable for breastfeeding in public and yet we're showing very often teenage breasts in a family newspaper because men like to see boobs when they read the news. It just didn't, it just didn't make sense. Um, and then I said, I'll tell you what I thought. I, I remembered this expression that I'd heard through m throughout my whole life in response to these pictures. And that expression was cool, look at the tits on that. And do you know what really got me is I'd never noticed the word that. Cool, look at the tits on that. I'd never noticed that this word that is used. And, uh, and, and pe we, pe we talk about objectification of women. And for me, that really summed it up. It was like, oh, she becomes a that. She becomes an object. She becomes dehumanized. And we know throughout history, when we allow people to be dehumanized, bad stuff tends to happen. And I thought about some of the bad stuff that can happen to women. And I looked up sexual assault and rape statistics, and they were pretty high. And I found a statistic at the si time that said one in four women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's, that's very high. And then I thought, oh, hang about, I've been sexually assaulted. Um, and I remembered when, I, when it happened to me, I told one person, and she told me she'd been raped, but she'd hardly told anyone 
herself. And I was like, so I, uh, and I started asking more and more people their experiences. And people were telling me, women were telling me one or two or three stories of incidences of sexual assault. And I was like, wow. So in light of this, you know, the UN talks about violence against sexual violence against women and girls is a, a, an epidemic. In light of this, is it sensible to be showing pictures of naked women in a family newspaper in this way? I'm not saying that a man will look at an image and go out and rape, for example. I would never say that. I'm just saying, in light of this, is it sensible? Is it sensible to be showing this? It just didn't seem sensible to me. Um, so I was feeling a lot of passion. I can still feel it now. And I wrote a letter to the editor of The Sun and asked him to please stop showing the, the, <laughs> the topless images. <laughs> and I said, I'll bullet point my reasons, because there are quite a few. <laughs> and I sent him a three-page letter. And I knew it would do nothing. I knew this letter would do absolutely nothing. And I just thought, wow. But I still feel all this passion. In fact, I felt so much passion, I thought, can I feel all this passion and be the only one? And we live in an amazing time. <laughs> because the internet, the internet being this incredible thing in our age, allowed me all these free tools to find out if I was the only one. So very quickly, I'd started an online petition. I knew nothing about it. I'd never campaigned. I'd never done anything like this. I, I did a Google search, best online petition site. I found an article that listed five. Um, I picked change.org because they looked clean and easy to use. Um, started an online petition, started a Twitter, a Facebook, and a blog. So those four things, they're free, they're really easy to use. I, I'm rubbish on a computer. Um, and it allowed me to find out if other people felt similarly. Well, now we have um, very close to 195,000 signatures on that online petition. Please sign change.org slash no more page three. Um, and uh, People don't call us a campaigner, they say it's a movement. <laughs> I love that. Um, yeah, we have, uh, uh, I think, about 60,000 people um, in various um, social media um, communities. Um, we have huge uh, bodies of support, Mumsnet, Girl Guides, all the big teaching unions, all pretty much all the charities that work to end violence against women, including Rape Crisis, Women's Aid, um, the Welsh Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, 158 cross-party MPs, Caroline Lucas has stood up in Westminster, um, uh, speaking, uh, actually she stood up, it up in Prime Minister's Questions in a No More Page 3 t-shirt. We're doing it. Now the sun is continuing to show these pictures. Oh, I've got hardly any time. Can I go on a bit? Okay. Um, the sun is continuing to show these pictures. They did stop showing them in Ireland. They dropped them in Ireland last summer. I think they'll be gone within the year in the UK. I think that they can't continue to justify the unjustifiable. They say it's a good way of making money. But I think when you've got all these charities that work to end violence against women, all these teachers, all these youth groups, Girl Guides, British Youth Council, Girls Brigade, YWCA, all saying these are damaging. These pictures are affecting how young girls feel about themselves and how boys treat young women. Um, I think in light of that, I think the Sun are insulting their readers. Because actually, I haven't yet to meet a Sun reader who'd stop buying the paper if they dropped page three. Many of them say to me, you know what? It's different now. It was, it, you know, I feel like a bit of a perv. I turned that page rather quickly. You know, we've moved on. These pictures started in 1970. We were a really different era in 1970. There were only 26 female MPs out of 600 and something in 1970. Women had only had equal voting rights to men for 42 years in 1970. We are evolving. We're evolving into equality. We're doing so well. In 1970, a man could legally rape his wife. We've moved on. We shouldn't still be showing these pictures. Women deserve to be, respect in the uh, to be respected in the way they are represented in the newspapers, rather like men are. Yeah, so I have gone over my time. Thank you so much. I would just like to say, though, going back to stories, um, I'm trying to change the story, if you like, myself and a lot of volunteers who are working, an amazing team of people I'm working with, um, and lots of individuals. We've got, we've got no money, we've got no big, big celebrity name behind us, but we just, we just keep, keep banging on about it, and we will see change. But what I just want to say to you, if there's something that you feel really, really passionate about, believe that you have a voice, share your story. It will have a lot of power. Thank you.